the book of Samuel today. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is when I finish my teaching, stay in your seats because we have a little surprise for you. We've got some next gen teachers coming in and there's going to be singing and videos and a slideshow and all sorts of things for you. So just stay tuned for that. Um, and before I begin, I do want to mention our children's minute. So today the kiddos are talking about Jesus's first miracle, which was the wedding at Cana. And their memory verse for the week is from John 13, 34, which is love one another. All right, y'all. One of my absolute favorite, oops, hold on. I got to put my glasses on. <laughs> okay, so one of my absolute favorite Psalms is Psalms 91. It came into my life when I, when I was a relatively new believer. A dear mentor had shared it with me after my, I had received a phone call that my husband, had, who was in the Army at the time, was injured by a bombing incident during one of his deployments in Afghanistan. Well, as you can imagine, I clung to those words because they spoke of a mighty and powerful God who was trustworthy and available to be a helper and a protector in the midst of danger. The words to describe God in Psalm 91 gave me such a deep-seated hope for what I could believe in as well as pray for um, in regards to God's active hand of healing, deliverance, and safety over my husband while he was in a war zone. God showed himself so faithful you know, to his word to both of us. I can tell you that Psalms 91 has pretty much become a part of my testimony because now many years later, I can know that I know that I know that my God is everything that he says he is because I personally experienced his hand of rescuing on our lives. Every attribute listed of who God is in Psalms 91 was true to us during that hard time and it continues to be true to us today. The author of Psalm 91 is anonymous, but y'all, it makes me think so much about our David because all the battles that he has endured. David was a man who knew uncertainty, long seasons of waiting, and what it was like to be a fugitive on the run. As an underdog of his family, David was just a lowly shepherd boy the youngest of the eight sons of Jesse, yet God chose him and used those shepherding fields as a training ground for David to defeat the, the giant Goliath. And on that day, God sent a loud message to the nation of Israel by displaying through, uh, by displaying through David that true leaders aren't made by the stuff they carry or the size of their army, but by in whom they belong trust in and serve. We know that David certainly did not live a perfect life, but David had come to learn that he was perfectly loved by God. His uninhibited worship, celebration, and pouring out of his heart before the Lord is inspiring, isn't it? Throughout his entire life, David experienced the power, presence, and favor of God but he also experienced the cost and consequences of sin. However, by humbling himself before the Lord and repenting of his sins, God was merciful to redeem and bring restoration because ultimately that is the heart of our heavenly father. One of God's greatest delights that was, that is, and is to come is God's never ending rescuing heart for all people, which has been so beautifully on display through the life and example of David. God is trustworthy of all our praise and devotion because he is faithful to his word. He is exactly who he says he is, and he does exactly what he says he will do. He is the one who reaches down and comes to his own because God is our rescuer. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the testimony it is of your faithful promises towards us.
May we have hearts to worship like David. May we trust you wholeheartedly and seek you humbly in our times of need. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, well, our, the central idea for today's teaching is God is our refuge. And our three chapter segments are right there for you on the screen. So now, as we open our Bibles and find ourselves in the final chapters of 2 Samuel, we are reminded that David has been a skilled musician most of his life. It's no wonder that he gets credit for being the author of many of our Psalms. And it is sweet to see that David begins this time of reflection with a powerful song of praise. No one really knows when this song was written. Many believe David wrote it in his younger years, possibly after Saul died, but before his sin with Bathsheba, and now is bringing this song back to mind in his later years to reflect over that all that God has done for him. David begins this song using one vivid word after another to give glory to his almighty God, because God's work for David was so big and comprehensive that it could not be contained with just one title. Characterizing God's care over his life with military-like symbolism, David testifies that God is a rock that can't be moved by any who would, who would harm him. How about a fortress or place of safety where the enemy can't follow? A shield that comes between him and horn, a horn of salvation, which is the symbol of might and power, and a stronghold that is high above his enemies. David could praise God for these things because David had personally experienced God's deliverance from Saul, God's deliverance from his years of backsliding, God's deliverance from Israel's enemies. How about deliverance from his own rebellious son, Absalom, and even deliverance from his own lustful flesh and passions? David's poetic talents seem to take over as he describes what happened when he called on the Lord for help, as the awesome creator of the universe shook the earth, bent the heavens, thundered, and even hurled lightning bolts, bolts to scatter his enemies all in a response to David's prayers. And because David had seen and experienced God's mighty presence move on his behalf, David took God at his word, believing in the power of prayer and trusted that God was going before him. <laughs> Aren't you glad that the same God who called David, that David called upon is available to us? Y'all, there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Proverbs 18.10 tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. And John 14.14 14 says, if you ask me anything in what? In my name, I will do it. Now, verses 21 through 25 are the, are the main reason why so many people question when this song was written. It would be easier to believe it was before the Bathsheba incident, yet not all scholars agree. One explanation is that David believed in what the prophet Nathan had told him back in 2 Samuel 12, which was, the Lord has put away your sin if David truly took God at his word, then the cleanliness of his hands was because God had completely cleansed him, not because they had never been dirtied. David knew he was a sinner. Psalm 51 clearly shows us that with the depth of his anguish over his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. Most commentators agree that David isn't claiming sinless perfection here. But rather, David knew the true source of his deliverance. And by writing these words from God's perspective, it shows that David understood it was God who was the one who fully restored him, as Psalm 51.7 says, whiter than snow. 
y'all, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God does the same for us. We are made new, washed clean, spotless, and stand before our Lord completely blameless, all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The remainder of David's song returns to the theme of God's character and attributes, tying them to all the ways God had worked through them on David's behalf. Building on this point, David asked two questions, which are, who is God besides the Lord and who is the rock except our God? For David, for David there was no immovable rock like the Lord. God was the one who armed him with strength, trained and equipped his hands for battle, and rescued him from the attacks of his enemies. Because of who God is, David could only shout praises to all to hear that his mighty God was the one who protected him. David ends this song rejoicing over the Lord's loving kindness, but also expressing his joy that this was going to be for his descendants forever. Immediately following, the text gives us um, David's last public words, which are another psalm of praise for David for exalting, or for God exalting David from his humble beginnings in Bethlehem. As the sweet psalmist of Israel, David proclaims that it was the spirit of the Lord who spoke through him because God was the one to put his word on his tongue. These verses reveal that God had important work for David to do, as he does for every godly leader. David was to rule over God's own people, the sheep of his pasture, which was an enormous responsibility one that demanded integrity as well as a submissive attitude towards the Lord because without the fear of God, a leader can become a dictator, driving them like cattle instead of leading them like sheep. David had the welfare of God's people on his heart. And as God's anointed, he learned that a king who rules God's people righteously was a special blessing to the land, much like rain and sunshine that together produce useful fruit instead of painful thorns. Warren Wearsby in his commentary said, when David came to the throne, it was like the dawning of a new day for the nation of Israel. The storms that Saul had caused in the land were over and the light of God's countenance was shining on his people. Under David's leadership, there would be a harvest of blessings from the Lord. How beautiful is that? Well, we know that as Israel's king, David role modeled just leadership to the people, yet it wasn't done out of David's strength, but because of God's faithfulness to raise David up on high by making an everlasting covenant with him, which guaranteed David a dynasty and throne forever, which God fulfilled through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How worthy of praise is our mighty God, not just for David and his family, but for all families on the earth who believe in his great name. The same God that went before David goes before us because from everlasting to everlasting, God is our rescuer. All right, y'all. Well, I absolutely love an underdog story, and my latest favorite one is the recently released movie, The Boys in the Boat. Did anybody see that movie? Please go see it. Okay, which, and it's a book as well, but the movie is, is amazing. Okay, so this is a true story, y'all, and it's about the University of Washington rowing team. This team is made up of a hodgepodge of men from lower to middle class families who had, um, who had to earn, you know, struggled to earn their way through school during the Great Depression. 
get under the leadership of their coach and the bonds formed between the men. This team endures challenges, defies odds, and ends up winning the gold medal in the Berlin Summer Olympics of 1936. These men prove that it's not how you start, but how you finish, much like the mighty men of David, an unlikely band of brothers in which scripture back in 1 Samuel 22 tells us that they were a people who were in great distress, debt, discontent, and many were outcasts. If you remember, during this time, David was also considered a rebel because he had fled Saul and was hiding in the cave of Adullam. Yet these men came to David during one of his lowest points and remained faithful to David to the end. Now, if that isn't the mark of a loyal friend, I don't know what is, because many will be present with us in our greatest joys and celebrations. But who are those precious few that are there for you in your times of need, right? Now, as different as these men have been, were from one another, the one thing they had in common was their complete devotion to David, as well as receiving the benefits of learning from his leadership. These mighty men were a smaller army, yet they accomplished tremendous defeats. They were unknown by many, yet the Bible calls each one by name. Like a proud coach, David takes the time to highlight and pay tribute to some of his elite, beginning with Joash Besheth, who raised a spear against 800 men. And then there was Eliezer, who taunted, stood the, his ground, and struck down the Philistines, along with Shema, who stationed himself in the middle of a field when others fled, and he was victorious over the Philistines. Other special mighty men included Abishai, David's chief of the 30, and Benaiah, who was born a priest, yet became a valiant soldier, known best for chasing a lion into a pit on a snowy day. And so impressed by his fierce abilities, David honored him by making him um, the captain of his bodyguard. The favor of God that was upon David also came upon these men. And under David's leadership, these men flourished, becoming bold, brave, wise, and courageous. But what made them most victorious of all was the depth of their honor to one another. In verses 13 through 17, David gives us a glimpse of their warrior hearts of these men by sharing of a time when David was reminiscing and longing of a taste of water from a well near his boyhood home, wanting to please their king and brave enough to break through enemy lines. Three of David's men went to fulfill David's desire. But when these men came back and placed the cup of water in David's hand, uh, David didn't see it as a cup of water at all, but rather a cup of sacrificial blood from the men who were willing to risk their lives for him. David was so moved by their self-sacrifice that he felt undeserving to partake of such a worthy gift. So he poured the water out as a drink offering because he believed that the great sacrifice of these men could only be truly honored by giving the water to the Lord. David understood that in great leadership, sacrifice and honor go both ways. As these men honored David, David took the time to esteem and honor them as well. To me, y'all, this is a beautiful picture of, the, of our life as a disciple of Christ. Because Jesus, our anointed king, is the one who sacrificially laid down his life. And in gratitude for his unmerited gift, we in turn surrender our lives in service to him. It's under Christ's leadership that we not only are enabled and equipped through his love, but by his power and his presence in our lives, that we become transformed into mighty warriors 
before the kingdom. Before Christ, we too were in distress because we were dead in our transgressions. Yet in Christ, Colossians 1 tells us that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God is worthy of our honor and sacrifice because he is our rescuer. Now, as we come to the final chapter of the book of Samuel, I think we all wanted the book to end with a pretty and victorious ending, but rather it is a pretty realistic picture of the ups and downs of David's life and his walk with God. Verse 1 in chapter 24 says, Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and number Israel and Judah. However, when we go to 1 Chronicles 21.21, 21, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to count the people. <laughs> so the question becomes, who is the he in this verse? Is it the Lord or Satan? And it appears that the answer is both. Here's what we know. We know that God was angry with Israel, apparently because the people had sinned in some way. So God allowed Satan to tempt David into arrogantly counting the size of the troops under his command. This exchange between God and Satan might remind us of when God allowed Satan to test Job. Now, in principle, it is not sinful for a commander to count his troops in order to know if he had sufficient numbers to go to battle. But the Lord had made it clear to David that he, not the army, was the source of Israel's strength. On this occasion, I don't know how, but Joab was in the right as he objected to David's order because Joab saw it for what it was, a needless attempt by David to feel secure. David was putting his faith in the size of the army rather than in God's ability to protect him. And sadly, we can easily do the same thing when we place our trust and security in things such as money, possessions, our health, our children, and even the strength of our government. After nine months and 20 days, the count was determined as David then realized his mistake. Now, most of us would consider his wrongdoing with Bathsheba far worse than numbering of people but David felt within himself the enormity of what he had done. How could we forget that with David's sin with Bathsheba, it took the lives of four of his sons plus the life of Uriah. But after the census, God sent a plague that took the lives of 70,000 people. It's another sobering reminder for us that God in his grace forgives our sins when we confess. However, in his righteousness, he allows us to reap the consequences. In this particular case, the Lord gave David the opportunity to choose the consequences of his sins. And by the way, does anyone ever do that with their kids? <laughs> I literally had to do that last week with one of my kiddos who got in trouble. And so my husband and I were like, hey, congratulations. You can either do this, this, or this. And, you know, that kiddo wasn't very happy about that. But anyways, all right. Well, the three punishments given to David by the prophet Gad increased in severity from famine to war or plague, but they decreased in length from three years to nine months and three or three days. And after hearing the options, David wisely chose the form of punishments that came most directly from God because he knew how brutal and harsh men in war can be. Yet, he also had personally experienced and been the recipient of God's great mercy. David had come to understand that the safest place for him to be was in the hands of his God. <laughs> 
And as the plague began the next day and continued for the appointed three days, David's shepherd heart was broken as he pleaded for the Lord to punish him instead. Scripture tells us that somehow God allowed David to see the judgment angel hovering over Jerusalem. Yet true to God's merciful nature, God put a limit on the suffering by telling the angel when to stop. By the confessing of his sins, David took the responsibility for this tragic event, yet God does not take him up on his offer. Rather, God sends the prophet Gad back to David with a message of hope for David to build an altar in the same place God stopped the destroying angel, which was on the threshing floor of a Jebusite named Arona. All right, in Old Testament times, threshing floors were used after harvest time. Sheaves of grain would be opened up and the stalks spread across the, fl the threshing floor. Pairs of oxen or cattle would be walked round and round, often dragging a heavy threshing board behind them to tear the ears of grains from the stalk, loosening the grains from the husk. David was instructed to transform this place where shaft was separated from the wheat into an altar so that the plague on the people would stop. What a picture that is, y'all. And as Arona bows down to David, desiring to give David anything he would need, David knew that it would not be a gift nor a proper sacrifice for the Lord if it did not cost him something. In other words, David didn't look for the cheapest or easiest way possible to please God, and quite frankly, neither should we. A quote from Clark's commentary said, He who has a religion that cost him nothing has a religion that is worth nothing at all. Wow. Well, after purchasing the threshing floor and oxen for 50 shekels of silver, David offered a burnt and peace offering upon the altar, demonstrating that David understood that the death of 70,000 did not atone for his and Israel's sin because only by an approved substitute could atonement be made. As the Lord answered David's prayer, 1 Chronicles 21, 26 tells us that, that God showed his acceptance of David's sacrifice by consuming it with fire from heaven as God honored David's desire to be back in fellowship with his God. It's a remarkable thing to grasp that out of David's two greatest sins, which were his adultery with Bathsheba, and taking of the census, that not only did God bless Bathsheba with the birth of Solomon, the one who would succeed David on the throne, but on this property David purchased and built an altar, Solomon will build his temple, Israel's house of worship. Y'all, there is nothing that can't be redeemed for God's glory because God is our rescuer. Well, David's life and his relationships were complicated, much like a soap opera, yet so can't ours at some times as well. Amongst test trials, victories, and defeat, David never doubted the steadfast love of the Lord, and he unapologetically worshiped, praised, and cried out to the Lord with his whole heart. His anointing by God didn't provide him an easy life. Rather, it seems his life was one battle right after the next. But it was during those times that David personally experienced the delivering hand of his mighty God. For David, God was his rock, fortress, shield, and salvation. Everything that Jesus is for us. From Genesis to Revelation, God's word testifies of God's rescuing heart towards his beloved children because there is no battle where he is not. There is no sin he cannot forgive, and there is no wrong that he can't make right. 
because of Christ, because of Christ, we like David are God's anointed and have been delivered from all our enemies. Therefore, we too can sing and testify of God's faithfulness because of the cleansing powers of the cross. Will you, will I choose to wholeheartedly believe in God's rescuing ways? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your goodness. Thank you for the life and example of David. May we never forget that our freedom in Christ came at a great cost, which was the sacrifice of your sinless son. May we share your love and grace with others and choose to honor you in all we say and do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. All right, y'all, stay seated.